Predator, which, in spite of what you may think, has nothing to do with Tor. Uh, so the presenter is Brad Miller from Google, who uh, works on safe browsing. Uh, and uh, I've also learned that the first author, who unfortunately could not be here, the first author, Shuang, is uh, looking for a job. So if you like this, this work, you know, this, this may be a person you might want to look up. Uh, so in this talk, we're going to learn uh, how, we can, how we can find out which uh, internet domains are going to be used in malicious activities uh, before this happened and as early as registration time. Are you guys able to hear me okay? Okay. Uh, yeah, so like you were saying, my name is Brad, and I'm here to present Predator, which is a system for proactive recognition and elimination of domain abuse at time of registration. Uh, and I want to thank Tudor for explicitly calling out Schwang, who uh, was not able to be here today for visa issues. But uh, if you do like it, definitely talk to me, but also definitely talk to him, uh, because you know, I'm sure he would love to hear from you. And he is currently on the job market and looking for faculty positions. All right. So I want to start by making an observation about you know, maybe what some of us think of as domain abuse today. You know, perhaps somebody takes a domain. Uh, for example, here I've shown you know, cheaprx.com. And they use it to do something that doesn't actually add value to internet users, right? Like maybe they're selling, you know, counterfeit uh, pharmaceutical goods, right? But the truth is that, of course, you know, this isn't the whole story. You know, the story begins uh, when the domain is registered, and hopefully the story ends, you know, when the domain is detected, right? And so what we see is this three-part story that goes, you know, from registration to use to detection. Now, the only problem with this story is that detection is inherently a reaction to use, right? And so this kind of sucks because it means that, you know, we can't, like, protect users until some amount of users have been put at risk. And that's, you know, pretty suboptimal, right? And so there's, the, you know, this certain amount of inherent detection latency between when a domain is first registered um, and when user protection actually takes effect. And, you know, part of what I'll show over the course of this talk is that for many blacklisting techniques, that detection latency can actually be on the order of weeks, right? It could take quite a long time. So it's into this uh, system, or sort of the status quo that we have today that we introduce Predator, right? The system for detecting uh, malicious domains or abusive domains when they're registered, right? And so we want to take this story and we want to change it in a couple ways. You know, we want to eliminate the need for malicious domains or abusive domains ever to be in use. That lets us eliminate latency. Instead, we try and get to this world, right? Where we can go from registration to detection in just a matter of seconds, right? And when you think about it, this is like kind of crazy because most of the approaches that we've seen to do this type of stuff in some way rely on use of the domain. Either we want to see, you know, what sort of resources have been put up there and make some observations about that, or we want to see people resolving the domain, something like that. But, you know, in this work, we're going to try and actually do detection right at the time of registration. All right, so how are we going to do that? Uh, well, we'll start by making some observations that abusive registrations often have some distinctive properties. So, for example, maybe they'll share some common infrastructure like name servers, um, or maybe there'll be certain reusage patterns that emerge. Um, maybe abusive domain names actually end up having some textual similarity, so there'll be certain um, similarities between the strings, essentially, that we're able to use to identify these domains. So we'll make these observations. And we'll use that to construct 22 uh, classes of features, which will then uh, feed into a machine learning algorithm in order, to do our attack, in order to do our detection. We're going to evaluate our approach on five months of real data uh, and focus our evaluation on the identification of spam domains. So the rest of this talk is structured about as follows. Um, I'll begin with a case study where we look at actual spam domain registration behavior. Um, and then from there, once we've built kind of some understanding and intuition about what the problem space looks like, we'll get into the actual feature extraction and machine learning that we use in this work. And then we'll evaluate the approach, examine its robustness to adversarial evasion, and we'll make a couple concluding remarks. All right. So like I said, I'll begin with this case study on spam domain registration. Uh, we've structured the case study as follows. We're going to begin by looking at one standout day and making three observations about spam domain uh, registration behaviors. And I want to emphasize that this is not like just any random day. This is a day that we picked because it's really good for making these three observations. And what we'll see is that spammers are lazy, 
spammers are parasitic, and spammers are unimaginative. And I say this a little bit tongue in cheek, but you know, you'll see more of what we mean as we get into the case study. Once we've looked at that day, I want to look at two days that are a little less notable, right? Where we see how you know, these properties may be present to some extent, but uh, you know, it's not always as easy as the standout day that we pick. And lastly, I want to take a look at some of the labeling difficulty that we encountered in this work. Now, this isn't inherently a property of spam domain registrations, but it does play a lot into what made this research difficult. All right, so we'll begin on our standout day by taking a look at the registration volume that we see over time. So we've divided, uh, for a particular registrar here on the standout day, we've divided registrations into five minute intervals, and I've plotted here the total number of registrations to occur in each interval. Now, as you can probably tell, there's a couple intervals that stand out in particular, in particular these five, right? Three of which are kind of grouped at the left. And uh, you know, here we actually see much higher registration volumes. And it turns out that this is gonna lead us to our first observation, right? That spammers are lazy, and they tend to register domains in big bulk batches, right? And so what we've done here is color in registrations that ended up being malicious or appearing on a blacklist in red and left the benign registrations in blue, right? Now, you know, I said I was a little bit tongue in cheek, right? And we know that, you know, it's, while it's certainly easier to register domains in a batch like this, right? and, you know, that's some evidence of, of laziness in some sense, that's also not really the whole story, right? You know, the underground economy is very involved and these are very well uh, financed and motivated people, right? And so part of the story also involves registrars offering bulk discounts, you know, that create a very real incentive for this kind of behavior from people who expect to churn through a lot of domains. All right, so now moving on to the second observation, I said we'd see how spammers are parasitic. And the way that we'll see that is that spammers and often, in many cases, will tend to favor previously used domains, right? And so if we look at, um, you know, at our standout day here, at these five intervals that had a high volume, and then we investigate each of them more closely, we see that in the first three, the spam domain registrations are entirely previously used domains. Now, why does this happen, right? Many detection systems don't have any way of understanding when a domain has changed hands. And so by uh, picking up a previously used domain, the spammer is essentially able to inherit or kind of leech off any uh, prior positive reputation that domain might have had. But you can tell that not all spammers operate that way. And so in the final two periods, we actually see kind of the reverse, where the bulk of registrations are new domains that have never been seen before, All right? And so we'll take a look actually uh, at this last period to get a better idea of why that is. And that's gonna lead us to our third observation, which is that spammers are unimaginative, right? And so when we look at this here, we can kind of see this, and we see the value of new domains, which is that you know, maybe you have some spam kit, uh, which has some sort of theme, and so you need uh, topically appropriate domain names to work with your kit. It may be very hard to get these by picking previously used domains so you register new ones, right? And so I've shown here examples from an actual registration batch where we've colored uh, the common substrings indicating sort of, you know, the common themes that, that, sh that show up within this batch. All right, so, uh, Right, so I said earlier that we we're gonna begin by looking at one standout day, right? And that's what we see here, what I've shown here again in terms of the registration volume. But, like I said, you know, not every day is this easy. Now this registrar that I've picked here for our standout day happens to be one of the registrars that receives the, you know, absolute most uh, spam domain registrations. It's very frequently used by spammers. Turns out that if we look at another one of the registrars that's very frequently used, on the same day, we see very different behavior. Right? And so clearly, you know, not all days are quite as straightforward as the standout day that you picked out. If we go back to our first registrar at the next day, we see a kind of similar thing. You know, there are some spam registrations that occur, but they're not uh, quite as distinguished, you know, as on the day that we initially picked. All right, so switching a little bit from looking at the uh, behaviors of spam registration, I want to look now at some of the uh, challenges that made this work, or one of the challenges in particular that made this work difficult, and we see you know, well embodied in our case study. And that has to do with ground truth labeling errors, right? So it's a reality of life that blacklists are incomplete. They don't have everything you know, on them that perhaps they should, right? And so this presents challenges. 
Um, and there was two particular ways that these challenges plagued us in our work. One is that if you have mislabeled domains, that will tend to confuse your model in a, in a training process, right? So if your training data has the wrong labels, you will you know, potentially learn the wrong thing. That's a very real risk. Uh, the second and more subtle way is that any domain that is actually a malicious domain or actually a spam domain but isn't correctly labeled as such, will actually, but we detect, will actually show up as a false positive during our evaluation. Right? So this is pretty tough because you know, we find something, we were supposed to find it, we were right, but it's not on the list, and as a result, you know, our perceived performance kind of nosedives. So this is undesirable. Now, it turns out that our standout day is actually also a great day for illustrating our labeling difficulties. So uh, looking at this plot, you, know, you may or may not notice something about it that's a little bit off. Um, in case you didn't pick it up, I'll put this box here you know, to kind of guide you in the right direction. Now, something about this should seem odd, right? It should feel kind of weird that somebody showed up and registered you know, 50 or 100 benign domains the same time that someone else was doing all these malicious registrations, right? And if we look into it, it of course turns out that these are mislabeled spam domains. So you know, we see here some evidence of these uh, labeling challenges that we faced in the work. All right. So now that we have kind of a feel for what the problem space looks like and some of the behaviors and trends that we see, I want to talk about how we actually use that intuition to structure features in our work and the machine learning techniques that we apply to those features. Uh, so of course, before we can do any feature extraction, uh, we have to have some raw data. And the raw data that we have, uh, we obtained from VeriSign, who is a, a partner for this work, uh, and we got basically uh, updates to the uh, name servers for the .com and .net top level domains at five minute increments. So these included all creation um, and expiration events on those top level domains at five minute intervals, as well as a little bit of uh, 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 ancillary data, things like the registrar that may have been associated and registration history of the domain. Our data notably did not include the registrant, so the person who may have registered the domain because VeriSign has no need to know that, or the IP address that the domain ultimately resolved to. So these are two things that you might think would be you know, pretty useful for detecting malicious domains, but uh, actually neither of them were used in this work. Now for context here, I'll point out that registrars would actually have much more data than this available, and you could actually envision them enriching, extracting much richer features and building a more complete model. Uh, for example, they would know the registrant, and they would know what IP that registrant used, and a lot of other useful stuff. Um, and while our data was obtained from VeriSign, there is a lot of similar data that is available publicly. So for example, you know, the name server domain can obviously be obtained directly from the domain name system itself. Much of this information is in Whois, um, and there are public services like domain tools that track uh, domain history. All right, so now that we have some feel for the data, I want to walk through three classes of features that we extract in this work. The first, uh, or the first family of features we'll refer to as domain profile features. Um, and so these are features that we can extract from a registration event in isolation. So things like the registrar, name server associated with the domain, um, and properties of the string itself that's been registered. Um, one more subtle feature or less obvious feature that we extract here is the edit distance to known bad domains. So for this, we take the, the Levenstein edit distance, which measures similarity between strings as a function of insertion, deletions, and substitution operations. Now, in addition to domain profile features, we also look at registration history features. So these are uh, features that can be derived from previous registration data about a domain. And in particular, we only see the most recent previous registration. So this is things like any registrar that might have been used, the amount of time that the domain was expired, things along those lines. And one feature we use here that's a little bit uh, less obvious is actually the amount of latency between an expiration and a creation event for a domain. And we're actually going to separate uh, the types of registrations or re-registrations based on this into drop catch and retread. Now a drop catch registration, we actually say occurs when a domain is re-registered almost immediately upon its expiration. And so for our work, what that meant was we see the creation and expiration events within the same five minute zone update. 
Uh, and a retread, on the other hand, could be any amount of increased latency beyond that. And so sometimes this is on the order of you know, days, weeks, or it could even be months. Now the final class of features we'll refer to as batch correlation features. And so these are features that we extract from a, uh, these are features that we extract from a domain uh, as well as all of the domains that are registered within the same five minute interval uh, at the same registrar. And so this includes things like the total size of the batch, the number of domains that are registered, the rate of, um, the rate of different types of reuse, things along these lines. And one feature here that I want to particularly call out is this notion of name cohesiveness, which we measure using Levenstein at a distance. Now name cohesiveness is a property that an individual domain holds with respect to the rest of its registration batch. So what I've shown here is an example registration batch that contains six different domains. And as you can see, some of these have more in common with the rest of the batch than others. So for example, the domain asklenderhome.com we say is cohesive because there are many similar domains in the same batch. And the domain stationary.com is uncohesive. So once we extract these different features, we need a way to actually embed them in vectors so that we can do machine learning. Um, each of the features that I've presented is either ordinal, continuous, or categorical, where ordinal essentially means ordered discrete values like integers. Uh, continuous means real, potentially bounded values like a probability that's between 0 and 1. And categorical means unordered discrete values. So for example, the days of the week, you know, while they may technically have an order, uh, we essentially treat them as distinct values that are not inherently ordered. Uh, and once we've uh, vectorized all of our features, we then normalize ordinal and continuous values so that all of our uh, feature values are within a bounded range. All right, so once we have our vectors, we apply a type of learning, on, or we apply a learning known as a convex polytope machine, uh, or CPM. And a CPM is an ensemble of linear subclassifiers. So what that means is that rather than using a basic linear model, like you see on the left here, like something like logistic regression or a naive Bayes, uh, we're able to actually introduce a nonlinear decision boundary. And that lets us achieve higher detection rates in low false positive regions in particular. Right? And so we actually tried a couple things, uh, but got the best results with this approach. All right. So uh, now that we understand you know, sort of the problem space and the features and learning that we're doing, uh, I want to actually evaluate our approach uh, and look at its robustness to adversarial evasion. So as I said, we worked with data that we got from VeriSign covering the .com and .net top level domains over a five month period. Uh, and we used three different sources for our positive labels. And so these included uh, spam house, URIBL, and a private spam trap. And I've shown here uh, sort of you know, raw totals of the values to give you some feel and context uh, for what we were working with. Now, uh, our dot com data was a little bit more complete, which we discuss in the paper. Uh, and so because of that, the results I'm going to pre present here focus predominantly on that. All right. So, um, I'll begin by talking about how we structure our experiment. So we design our evaluation to simulate the passage of time so that we can obtain the most uh, accurate representation possible of how this approach would actually perform in practice. So that means that we're going to periodically retrain and simulate the redeployment of a model as would happen in production. So at the start of our evaluation, we begin with some training data collection period. And then we have some slightly longer training label collection period. And we refer to the difference between these two periods as the training label cooling period. Now the motivation for this period, the training label cooling period, is that it will take some time for newly registered domains to actually appear on blacklists. And so there's this natural tension that occurs between the freshness of our training data and the quality of our training data labels. And by varying the training label cooling period, we're able to regulate that tension. So once we finish training label collection, we simulate putting a model into production, uh, and we evaluate it on some test data, uh, and we collect labels for our test data all the way up until the end of our experiment. And the motivation for this is that we want our test labels or our evaluation labels to be as complete as possible. And then of course, once this uh, process happens once, we sort of move forward in time and repeat the process. 
Now to give you some feel for the type of time periods we're talking about here, uh, training generally lasted for 35 days. Training label collection was a single day for the cooling period. We retrained every seven days and collected additional labels for at least three months after uh, experimentation ended. And we actually vary uh, these values some, uh, which we present in the paper, but these are the uh, values for the rest of the results that I'm presenting here. All right, so this is how we structured our experiment. Now, you know, this is the actual detection performance that we observe, right? So this is our ROC curve. And what we can see is that at a 0.35% false positive rate, we're able to detect 70% of the domains that ultimately appear on a blacklist purely at the time of registration. And this is actually, you know, probably pretty good, right? When you think about the fact that we have, you know, not a ton of evidence to go on here, right? But, you know, it's one thing to see these rates, but it's sort of, you know, a different thing to appreciate what this looks like in context. So the broader context is that our data set, for at least the .com top level domain, has about 80,000 domains daily, about 1,700 of which appear on a uh, spam blacklist at some point. So at 70% detection, that means we find about 1,200 spam domains daily, and at a 0.35 false positive rate, that'll yield about 280 domains daily. So we can see that the vast majority of what we're detecting uh, is actually uh, you know, true positives and malicious content. But, you know, as I pointed out earlier, our data has a demonstrated labeling issue, right? And so that introduced a lot of challenge for us in evaluation. So to help cope with that, we explicitly identified a subset of our data as benign using McAfee Site Advisor. Uh, and from that, we, and so that leaves another part of our data which hasn't been proactively identified as either benign or malicious. Uh, and out of that unlabeled pool, we observe that we detect about 1,000 domains daily. Now, uh, manual inspection reveals that out of these 1,000 domains, um, about 74% of a random sampling showed evidence of malicious activity uh, based on uh, use of historical usage behaviors which we observed. So, but as you know, um, you know, the entire story here isn't just about what we can detect, it's about the speed with which we detect it. So what I've shown here is our detection latency um, for the, each of the blacklists that we look at, from time of registration to when a domain first appears on the blacklist. And I'll add in our system here. So you can see that we actually are able to shave, uh, in many cases, days or weeks off of the current standard. Now, one of these curves obviously looks a little bit different from the others, right? Spam House seems to be doing something a bit different, and that's why, you know, they get detection uh, quite a bit faster. And it turns out that Spam House also seems to be doing some time of registration blacklisting. And we see quite a few domains appear on their blacklist within two hours of when they're registered. So to compare our performance against Spam House, we train and evaluate using just these domains. And this is what we observe. Uh, that basically for domains they blacklist, within two hours of registration, we detect the overwhelming majority of them. But for domains they blacklist at some later point, we're actually still able to detect about 50% of those domains, right? And so what this suggests, uh, and what we sort of demonstrate and uh, analyze a bit farther in the paper, is that our feature set is actually likely a, a superset of what they're dealing with. So now that we've seen how the, uh, now that we've seen sort of, you know, that the system works, and we've had a chance to look at its performance, uh, I want to take a closer look at why it works. And so we'll look at a normalized impact rating for each of the feature families that I talk about. And uh, we generate this, Using a, uh, using a variance-based metric. So for our 22 feature families, I've plotted the top 11 here by impact. Uh, and what you can see is that the domain profile features tend to be the most impactful, uh, with name server-based features being three of the top five. Batch correlation features uh, also play a role in the registration. History features also contribute. So if we consider the case of robustness now, and we're interested to understand uh, how the system would perform if somebody tried to evade it, we can consider removing these features from the feature space, simulating an adversary that's rendered them useless. So looking at our ROC curve here, uh, what we see, you know, this is our performance again with all of the features, right? So now if we consider removing our name server features, which were three of our five most impactful features, we see that the impact on performance is not too bad. Now, if we extend that to include text-based features, recalling that our second most impactful feature uh, was a textual property, we see that we take a slightly larger drop. And if we include batch features as well, uh, then we take a bit larger drop. 
Now for context, I'll point out here that these black and purple curves correspond to removing large portions of our feature space. Uh, but, you know, you can see that we still achieve, uh, you know, non-negligible detection. All right, so to wrap up here, uh, you know, we begin with this story, right, where we have registration, use, and detection, and detection can take some number of days or weeks. And we transform that into a story where red detection can happen, you know, very quickly after registration. Uh, we're able to achieve 70% coverage at a 0.35% false positive rate, uh, and we offer some degree of robustness against adversarial evasion. So I'd be glad to take uh, any questions at this time. Let's thank the speaker. We have time for a couple of questions, maybe. Uh, let me start by uh, asking uh, perhaps uh, not so usual a question about this, this kind of work, which is, can you uh, tell us a little bit more about the feature engineering part, right? So how, how, how you came up with these features, right? And what, how, what would you advise other uh, people who are looking to using machine learning for some security problem? You know, how, how would you approach the feature engineering uh, problem? Right. I think basically lots and lots of time spent looking at raw data. Um, so, you know, actually looking into, you're getting some intuition first about like the batch behavior and then looking into batches and seeing, you know, oh, there seem to be a lot of these similar strings, right? And, you know, thinking about how we could use that um, and building up, you know, domain knowledge about the problem space, like that, you know, maybe the name server is, they have, maybe they have less motivation to rotate that um, than they do the, you know, the actual domains themselves because normally detection kind of focuses more on the domains. Um, so sort of a combination of domain knowledge and um, aggressive investigation of the data. Um, hi. So um, I'm asking about the false uh, positive rate, for example, 0.35%, even though it's small, but if you take the large number of domains being registered every day at various registrars, this will constitute a large number, relatively large number of domains. So don't you think, I mean, Flagging these as malicious or spam or whatever may create troubles or problems, and how can we get this number even lower because it's important to get as low as possible? Right. So I guess I have uh, a couple thoughts about that. Um, so one thought would be that, you know, the um, like I pointed out, we face some labeling challenges, and so you know I think it's it's plausible that our effective false positive rate or our true false positive rate might even be a bit lower. Uh, but additionally. I'll point out that you know, there's multiple ways that we could envision um, deploying or using this work, and it doesn't necessarily have to mean um, immediate blacklisting at the time of registration, right? So for example, you know, maybe you deploy a system like this as a registrar, and if something shows up as being um, interesting or likely malicious, then you basically subject the registration to higher scrutiny. Um, like either you require, you know, a more verified method of payment, um, right, or some sort of, uh, you know, additional investigation to raise the bar on, um, on actually, you know, putting the domain into use. You could add that the registrar also may have more features. Right, and that's, that's also true, that, you know, if a registrar were to deploy a system like this, it's also very conceivable that they could achieve a lower false positive rate uh, just because they'd have more features available. So not only would they know the registrant, uh, for example, or at least the purported registrant information, but they would also have you know, other data about that, like you know, the IP address that was used to register the domain, um, and things that uh, you know, would never even make it into you know, Whois records. So will the third speaker please set up? Uh, and I actually have a follow-up question on that. Um, third speaker, can you set up, please? You don't need set up, okay. Uh, okay, then I'll take my question offline. All right, so let's take right. the speaker again.